uh, Dr. Cole, I, I was so inspired by your remarks, but I'm going to test you with two questions, see if, if I and you can remember both. <laughs> First of all, my brother uh, has, is the Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, and uh, in presenting the governance case for the Baki case, he pointed out that we're opening a Pandora's box when we talk about having representation from minorities, because in many of our major cities, the white individual would be the minority. So I'd, I'd like some comments on that. And the other question is that, as the leader of the fair housing movement in Cleveland for the past 40 years, I found that racial differences are easily overcome in terms of housing patterns, but not social economic ones. I'd appreciate some comments on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for both questions. I really applaud your willingness to raise a question that seems to really haunt so many folk in our nation. And the question seems to be, if I can rephrase it, if we provide equal opportunity here for this group of folk, will we inevitably deny it to others? It's a notion of zero-sum game, and I reject it. As I said yesterday when I had the joy of speaking with leaders at KeyBank, the point is not to remove any group from the table. It is to make welcome Folk from all groups, and I turned to my sister Margot Copeland and I said, and I know you know, that if the table isn't big enough, you better build a bigger table. <laughs> you've also asked, not asked, excuse me, you've also shared your experience, which is that in the area of housing, it is easier to break down patterns of discrimination than in other arenas. I wish that were my experience. When I look across our nation, I still see what Professor Cornell West once described as chocolate centers with vanilla outlying parts. Indeed, if we could make more substantial progress in integrating housing, what would follow would be education. And one of the reasons that our schools remain so fundamentally segregated and not equal today is because schools are patterned off of housing. Housing also has an enormous amount to do with jobs. Granted, people do travel, at least we used to before the gas prices got to where they are. And so, while there is progress, anyone who would deny it, and certainly someone like myself could not deny it, having grown up in the southern part of the United States, when among my early lessons, had to do with the colored water. Because I better drink the colored water and not the white water. My only lessons had to do with colored schools, colored libraries, colored museums, colored neighborhoods. And to say that there has been no progress would be despicable. But it would also be foolish in my view to say that in housing or any other arena in our society, the difference no longer makes a difference. Dr. Cole, thank you for sharing your wisdom and inspiration with us this afternoon. But I would like to um, look at another diversity, and that's generational diversity, mm -hmm. and ask about your observations about Generation Y on the college campuses and those that are getting ready to enter the working world, how are they, if at all, different as students? How are they viewing the issues of race and gender? 
and what is their reaction to the current political environment? Mm. I'm going to say immediately, my sister, that my hope is in this younger generation. At least some of these young ones. <laughs> Certainly my experience on the campuses of Spelman and Bennett, and as I move through academic um, circles, I do sense that young people of this generation are looking at the world rather differently. And when, in fact, there's a conversation between someone in that generation and mine, often I get the look of, you had to go to what kind of school? You had to drink at what kind of water fountain? And so I must be honest and tell you that one of my concerns is when young folk, especially students of color, do not have a true visceral sense of what this struggle has been about. And yet it is refreshing to know that their friends often cross all kinds of lines. I was really privileged to have some special time yesterday with my brother, the brother president of the Cleveland Foundation. And I was talking with Ron Richard about this notion of friendship across lines, across race and gender and age and sexual orientation, class, religion, ability and disability, in those schools which are more integrated, young people do not move always by, as Spellman President Beverly Daniel Tatum would say, by sitting at the black table. We're beginning to see now that young people can approach these notions of difference differently. And what is the fundamental message there? It is, in my view, that bigotry and discrimination, those things are learned. And some of us, including myself, have had to learn how to unlearn some of our biases. But the most powerful lesson is that we can just stop teaching it. And many of the young folk in that generation that you're referring to that seem to move without so many of these shackles of bigotry, they have just not learned how to be bigots. Hmm. Imagine a world if we women Folk, for example, raise not only feminist daughters, but feminist sons. Imagine if in our households, in our families, we simply would not tolerate those jokes about whatever group the joke is being made about. And so, I have a lot of hope with this generation. I also have some concerns. We as educators talk about this millennial generation who have a kind of sense of entitlement that can at times just be disturbing. I have a concern when, when they are not as philanthropic as many in my generation are. Although when they get on something, it can be like white on rice. <laughs> or in tribute to diversity, I could say like black on coal. <laughs> and it's very encouraging, for example, to see many individuals in that generation who care so deeply about this environment and who don't see protecting this only earth that we have as the business of only one group. And so I've wandered a bit from your question, but I want to end by saying that my message, and it will certainly be the one I will give when I meet with my young brothers and sisters who've come here for this luncheon. You know, you're the only future I have, and I really am counting on you. <laughs>